This coffee addict has already started this morning, and I wish I could say this is like my first cup, but it's not. Um, well, welcome. Thank you guys so much for having me, as if it was a lot of your guys' choice, right? Um, but thank you for choosing to be here this morning. Well, I have a lot to cover, and my little ADD self, um, usually bunny trails. I told Ryan this morning I made some PowerPoints, but if we stick to it, we stick to it. If we don't, eh, I'm not super concerned about it, <laughs> okay? So we'll see where the morning takes us. Um, I kind of want to start off, uh, yes, I have been a psychology professor for the last 11 and a half years. I also have a private practice, I'm a marriage and family therapist. And in my clinical work, I have noticed over the last decade, which when you say it, it makes me feel old, but over the last decade, I've noticed that there's like a ceiling to healing um, when we aren't meeting all of our needs. So what I mean by that is, from psychology perspective, which psychology in and of itself in the world is extremely secular, right? It's hard to, um, or I feel like the world finds it very difficult to combine God and psychology as if they are separate things. As if the creator who created the world and created us did not also create our minds and our emotions and our biology and our physiology, our brains, our emotions, all of the things, right? And so, and we are created in his image and therefore we also have all of those things. I notice when, um, cause even though I, my private practice is in a church building, my office is in there, I also meet with a lot of people who do not want faith to be a single part of our therapy, which is totally fine. Um, but depending upon our relationship, I do eventually tell them there is gonna be a ceiling to your healing because we are created mind, body, heart, and soul. And if I'm only working with your mind and possibly working with um, making your body even healthier, there's eventually going to come to a point where, sure, you can function better, but ultimately if without a lot of the faith piece and a lot of the whole, we are created all of those parts, if we don't heal all of those, there's no, it's only going to get so far. And so today, um, I'm going to talk to you about how do we actually heal and do some of those things. I'm more of like a practical person, so I would like to give you some practical tips to deal. Um, specifically, we're going to talk today about anxiety in particular. Anyone feel a little anxious or ever felt a little anxious, right? Um, and honestly, Anxiety and depression have a lot of common features. And a lot of us have anxiety-induced depression. We go, 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 do, 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 and then we like take a break and we crash. Anyone ever felt like that? Like the whole entire Saturday worth of just streaming shows, right? Or like we stop for a day and all we can do is like, you know, nothing, game or nap, sleep nap, sleep, nap, and repeat, right? So some of those things that might look like depression are oftentimes, especially within your age group, a symptom of anxiety. One in four individuals um, in adolescence, so adolescence brain-wise, so we'll talk neuroscience, is 12 through 25, 26, okay? So one in four adolescents are currently experiencing anxiety. Twice doubly in females, okay? Um, part of that is a little bit of our culture. Um, there's just a lot of pressure on women, gentlemen, and not that I'm saying that there's not. Um, but there is this research that was done in the UK that talked about the difference between men and women and the effects of anxiety. For women, it's like we have too much excessive amount of standards and men have like none 
or very low, whether that be on themselves or um, from culture. Um, there's actually even a part of that that even comes from parenting. There was a research done that was particularly on moms, not to blame your mom because your mom's fantastic, um, but there is an aspect of mothers, especially to their daughters, are actually a lot harder on their daughters. And a lot of like, hey, you gotta, from either moms or our peers or our culture, women hear a lot of, you have to do it all, be it all, um, be perfect, have it all, and look beautiful, and all the while not seeming like you're exerting any effort doing so. And a lot of women think, at least I'm experiencing this over the last three or four years in my college, with my college students, um, the women are the ones, and I'm, I'm talking generally, there's outliers always, but generally speaking, the girls are like, oh, is there extra credit opportunities? Do you have extra credit opportunities? I will do all 20 options. Um, and, and, and even though the, that's the, those are the ones that have like a 96 in the class, and they're like doing every possible extra credit opportunity just so that they could possibly get like a 100 or 101. Um, I literally last year had someone who had a 99.8 and she asked if she could do some extra credit opportunities. And I was like, no, if you do one, I will fail you. <laughs> I don't wanna grade it. Um, but um, oftentimes there's such high unrelenting standards that women either put on ourselves or are put onto us. Whereas the flip is, and that's how anxiety is being demonstrated. And honestly, in women, you're praised for that. Our anxiety is being driving us and driving us and driving us. And to the point of, I mean, for some of us, we will just crash and burn. And we feel like a failure. You know, we're worried that we're not enough, too much yet, not enough, right? Um, and we are um, just constantly berating ourselves with that, um, those high standards. Where men, um, especially in these, the later adolescence, early adulthood, but still kind of throughout, are experiencing the flip where they don't feel like there's any standards being put on them. And I'm experiencing, especially in the college students, where men are like, okay, can you show me where the bar is to pass. You know, I want to be able to just more like do this than high jump, okay? And they're like, so what do I have to do just to get like some C's and D's? Because I get the same piece of paper, right? You're like, no, stop that, stop that. <laughs> Um, but a lot of it comes from even in this research, this UK research, the, a lot of it was with the, the moms in particular, but dads as well, they weren't putting any pressures on the young boys or young men. And they were more, especially the moms were just kind of like rescuing the boys. Like, oh, no, 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 here, let me do that for you, sweetie pie. Oh, no, just come here. I'll do this for you. And they're like, with the girls, like, suck it up, get it done. This is your responsibility. And so inadvertently, we're creating this culture with men of telling them, not directly, and this is not the heart of your parents, or it's not the heart of the culture around you, but it is underlining, telling young men, you aren't competent or capable. And that's what a lot of young men are experiencing is like, I don't, like, I, 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 what if I fail? And I would much rather do just enough to pass versus working my butt off and trying and studying and doing, and then what if it's not enough? Then I'm not enough. And then I'm actually like, oh, wow, my best isn't good enough. And men's biggest fear is failure. And so then it says something to them in their identity. But we're creating a culture where just don't, and then it doesn't say anything about you. And then we kind of get to shirk off our responsibilities of failure or mediocrity by just, 
well, I'm just not working hard. I'm just like, I got other things going on and eh, I'm just, I'm getting by. Um, I promise you that doesn't work really well in like the workplace or marriage. So um, these are things to work on. So part of it, as we talk about it, 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 in women, anxiety is being shown as over, over work, overdoing. Um, and we're praising that. In men, it's the stopping. It almost looks like depressive symptoms, but it's out of this anxiety of a fear of failure. And with 77% of the general population now are experiencing, especially after this year, anxiety-induced symptoms. Everything from like panic attacks that make you feel like you're just underwater and can't breathe to um, anyone have sleeping problems? I mean, well, you're college students. Yes, three to five hours of sleep is a sleeping problem. Okay. <laughs> um, struggles falling asleep. Do we have those ruminating thoughts when we like, oh my gosh, I'm exhausted and we lay down and our brain's like, woo, time to party. We're going to think about everything possible um, when we finally lay down. And what that is really from is because we haven't given our brain any time throughout the whole entire day, week, or month to actually take a breather. And so it's when we finally lay down that the brain's like, oh, now, now I, can, I can think. Now I can process life. Now I can think through and process what happened throughout the day. Okay, okay, we'll do that for like an hour and a half. Um, other people, um, those wonderful humans that have the ability to just lay their head down on the pillow and just like knock out, teach me your ways. Like, I think that's really, um, I'm not going to get into it, but there are just types of personalities and the way our brains are structured that we can do that. Um, but are we waking up in the morning and we're exhausted and we're like snooze, snooze, snooze. Do you have that roommate? It's like snooze. <laughs> Some of them are like, you know, pointing them out, <laughs> um, the, snoozing. And we finally get out of bed, but we are exhausted. And part of that is because our cortisol, which is our stress hormone, um, if we are not actually going into deep sleep, Getting that six to eight hours of sleep, which I know is kind of like a phenomenon a lot of times in college, but that might also be like a that we need to like change some things. Um, but our cortisol is not leaving our body. The primary way that cortisol leaves our body is through deep sleep. There's a lot of things that um, our body only does during deep sleep. And there's a lot of things like alcohol, stress, um, lights and noise in our rooms that are gonna keep us from going into that deep sleep. And so um, we talk about, I'm gonna talk about today rhythms. And God actually created the, the whole sun and moon situation actually for, I'm sure there's a lot of benefits, um, but one of the things that it affects our body is in melatonin protection. Melatonin is the natural production in our bodies that make us go to sleep. And that is, during the day, the sunlight emits a blue light, like our phones, right? Okay, so it keeps us up, right? We, we kind of want to be alert and awake to do the things that we need to do during the day. Well, as sunset happens, it starts to radiate this red light, which is actually really beneficial. So it's like sunset, just go out, especially in Kansas. Like it's the few things that are really beautiful about the state. So like soak it up. Um, so, so like noticing and going out and that red light that's actually emitted by that sunset is actually really beneficial for us. But it also starts to produce melatonin. And melatonin is what's going to start to get down our body to go to sleep. But if 
we're still looking at our phones or TVs or things like that till 11, 12, 2 a.m. Or those people who think that they have to have their TVs on to fall asleep. Um, no, it's called classical conditioning. If you took in Jen Psych, remember Pavlov's dog? You're the dog, right? Bell TV, okay? You've just created this classical conditioning to go to sleep. And also it's a little bit distracting so you don't think, but your brain's not processing the things that it needs to. But that light, I mean, close your eyeballs right now. Some of you are like, check, already did, already was. But if you close your eyes, can you not still see the light, right? Put your hand in front of your face, right? You can kind of, you can see that there's, you can see through your eyelids. Your eyelid, okay, now open your eyes. Okay, good job, good job. Um, we can still see light through our eyelids, which is still keeping us awake. It's still producing the cortisol while we're sleeping. It's not letting that melatonin work, okay? So why we don't feel very restored when we wake up, okay? So our body is actually created for seasonal rhythms, okay? It's why we also, like in the fall and winter, we start getting a little squishier. Anyone else? You're like, actually, it started back in March last year, <laughs> and I just keep getting squishier. <laughs> um, we're, we're protecting ourselves. We're not positive what we're protecting ourselves from, but we are protecting ourselves. Um, but in those winter, to get, add some a little insulation. And then what do we do in spring? Okay, I guess I'll start going to the gym, <sighs> working out more, starting next Monday. <laughs> okay. Um, but there's just rhythms to our lives. And I'm wanting to dive into a few of these. Before we get started, um, the very first ones, our body reacts um, before our conscious mind recognizes that it does. For many of us, this week was supposed to be spring break, right? Um, do we remember last spring break? Do we remember not coming back from last spring break? Okay. Um, for many of us, you know, Facebook really creates a lot of this, what we call anniversary reaction or anniversary trauma. And we think back, because it's been a year. That went fast and really slow at the same time, right? It's like the days are so long, but the year went, whew, okay? Um, but as we're coming up on a year, we're remembering what that was like for us when we're told we're not coming back, when we're told we're entering shutdown, when we're told all of these things. So now our body is responding to the, all of the, what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen, what is it, all this confusion, all of the things we're missing out on, it reminds us of the prom we didn't go to, it reminds us of the um, grad, high school graduation we didn't get to have, it reminds us of the not being able to come back and see our friends, our roommates, all the things. And for it, some of us, we have a lot of trauma anniversaries. Okay, actually just last week, I celebrated my 15th year clean and sober. And as an addictive personality, it was like whatever I could be addicted to, I was addicted to, so pick it, I was. And, um, but a very traumatic experience happened to me, a sexual assault. And shortly thereafter, um, because I went down a lot more spirals shortly after that. But on May 7th, 15 years ago, I decided to really shift my life around and really follow the Lord um, and walk with God and choose his ways over mine because mine obviously weren't working for me. They were really keeping me in a lot of bondage. They were keeping me stuck and they weren't leading to life-giving things and really made the choice. And um, I promise you following after God is worth it. Not easy, not easy. Anyone tells you following Christ is easy, they're, they're like really misleading you, okay? Um, Jesus is totally worth it. God's ways are worth it. Um, and I love, I'm really like, um, 
I don't know what the word would be. I, I'm really passionate about the word so that right now because I feel like that really sums up a lot of things that I'm passionate about when I think about faith. Um, because I, I did, wasn't raised as a Christian. I didn't know Jesus until later um, in my early adulthood. And so I was just taught like, don't have sex till you're married. Why? Because I said so. Like, it's just wrong. And there was never like a, so that. There was like a, don't drink, don't do drugs. Why? Well, because it's illegal. <laughs> um, but there was never like the so that piece. And I, I feel like it goes even back to the garden of, you know, God said, here's all of the trees. All the fruit. It's not like God had like three out there and he said, here are the trees you can eat from. And, but this one right here, nope. God said, here's all. It was a garden. It was, here are all the trees. And I've been to Israel. They have a lot. They have a lot of fruit trees. They don't just have like neat trees like Kansas. There's just trees for tree sake or shade. They have like trees for food. Um, and here, eat all of this. Just not that one. So God original is like, here, you can do all of this. You can have all of this, just not this. And there was a warning with that. And Satan originally comes in and says, hmm, so God says you can't. And we've lived life in that. We live life out of that scarcity mentality. God says, here is all that I have for you. I want to bless you. I want to prosper you. I want to take care of you. I want to provide for you. I want to protect you. I want to give you life, not death. And our world's like, hmm, so God doesn't want you to have fun. And a lot of that keeps us stuck, keeps us in bondage. And... Um, I'm really going off on a major tangent that I wasn't really planning on going. So I'm going to kind of circle us back. But a lot of those things, when we are um, not living according to God's ways and wills, and honestly, how do we know what God's will is for our life? Through scripture. We will not know what God has for us if we do not read. Dear Lord, please do not listen to even just me. Don't listen to Christian speakers. Don't listen to just what you hear on the like radio or news or your podcasts or books, even Christian books. Like those are all beneficial and can, but as we've just even recently seen in so much news, really great Christian people are still broken, sinful humans. Let's not follow people, let's follow God. And, and also, let's not keep people as our idols and say when they fail us or they hurt us, then that's who God is. No, please, 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 because, oh my goodness, this might be a blessing of not being raised in the church. Um, I find scripture fascinating. I was 26 when I first heard the whole story of Jonah and the whale. And I was like, dude, there was this guy who was eaten by a whale, swallowed, because he wasn't eaten. He was swallowed by a whale and he lived. And note to self, just do what God asks and it'll work out. <laughs> Don't try to do your own thing. But I, I was like, why do people say the Bible's boring? But I think a lot of it is we don't read it. We've just heard or we don't understand. Please, please dive into scripture with commentaries. Commentaries helps us read it from what the writers meant and not from our culture reading in and pouring into scripture. But so much of scripture says, so that. And so I'm going to totally, totally skip. Ooh, there's a couple actually really good things. Trauma shapes you, it doesn't make you. Make sure that the things that we go through in life, they help mold you, they help make you. Hopefully they make us stronger. I am definitely, man, when I give, out, give up the trauma and the hurt and the pain that has happened since I was even seven years of age, like I, I think, man, God has made beauty from ashes. But I have to give that over to God. I gotta let him use those things instead of keeping that bitterness and resentment and hate and hurt. Now, 
If you think about a tree, like I was still burnt on the outside, right? I got some scars internally and externally, but like I'm still a tree inside. I'm still me. It does not shape who I, it does not make me. It is not my identity. And oh my gosh, if you can hear one thing out of today, please hear this. The culture right now that you live in is trying to tell you five million different things about who you are and what makes up your identity. Please, please seek out scripture to really say, figure out who the one who actually created you says who you are. The thing that will never change, because the thing about culture is, give it 10 years and what your identity is today, in 10 years it's gonna be different. And we wonder why we're anxious. We wonder why we're confused. We wonder why we're like, I don't even know what's up or right, down or right or wrong, good or bad. And we're like eggshelling life, right? Does anyone feel that when they talk to friends or a new person, you're like, what can I talk about? <laughs> now even when we try to connect with another person, we're like anxious. Like, so how's the weather? You know, that's like what we're limited to talk about. Um, but trauma doesn't shape you. And I love this. Uh, this was from uh, Dr. Anita Jacobs. She wrote, um, Jesus testifies what you can, uh, that you can have scars. You think about it, Jesus has scars. He was imperfect. Like he was humiliated. He was spit on. He was tortured. He was uh, shouted out really horrible names. He was denied. He was given up by his friends. He was betrayed and he was killed. You think you had a bad day. And he has scars. But Jesus also teaches us that those scars can be there and also demonstrate who we are and what we've done and what we've overcome. Preach. What we've overcome, death. Woo! Right? Jesus. Um, but to not let them to continue to fester. Jesus didn't go around, see what you did. See what happened to me? Like it's still oozing. It's still all this. No, his scars were healed. And he lived them and he... He didn't try to erase them. I mean, he's God. He could have like, perfect, but he didn't. He let his scars be seen. I'm gonna skip way over. Please read Ephesians 4, 17 through 30. It's really great. The biggest part of that I really wanted people to hear about was like the scripture talks about being renewed, taking off our old self and putting on our new. And to be renewed by God's spirit, we need to actually do things. Renewing isn't like, okay, God, renew. I'm waiting. Has it happened yet? Anyone? <laughs> you know, like by the renewing of our minds and be renewed and putting on the new self, we're like, how am I supposed to know when that's happened? Okay, we actually got to do something. We want to participate with God in this. Um, Rhythms of Renewal. This is a book by um, Rebecca Lyons, and she talks about her story with panic attacks, anxiety, and depression, and even her history of um, mental illness within her family. And she talks about this from a Christian perspective of what to do f to develop emotionally, physically, um, emo uh, psychologically, mentally, spiritually, all the things in how we were created, okay? It's not just the mind. It's not just the body. Because I will say, from a Christian perspective, sometimes we, um, we either say, just pray about it. And I don't want to discount or diminish the power of prayer because it's huge. And it does, and it has helped many of people. Otherwise, this thing wouldn't continue to be spoken. But I will tell you, I work with so many people who have been so hurt um, by the church who tell them, well, you wouldn't be struggling like that if you had enough faith. I just want to, like, throat punch them in Jesus' name. Like, that is not accurate. That's not biblical. That would be telling someone who has diabetes, well, if you would just pray enough, your insulin would be fine. 
Like, said no one ever, okay? And it's not that Jesus can't heal, because if Jesus can bring back the dead, he can heal anything, okay? But sometimes our healing does not come in the form of no longer dealing with it. Guys, I also want to, like, say this. (laughs) Nowhere in Scripture does it say, God wants you to be happy, Do all these things so that you can be happy. No. Jesus even says, guess what? You're going to suffer. Like, who do you think you are? Better than Jesus? Like, if Jesus is going to suffer, what do you... (laughs) I mean, it's super prideful to think, like, I shouldn't suffer. I know Jesus did, but I'm far better than him. (laughs) You know? Think about it for a moment. Paul didn't have a peachy keen life, right? The people who were the foundation of our Christian faith suffered a lot. And guys, I don't want to mean, I don't mean to be like doom and gloom here, but I really want this to be serious. Our generation is going to face a lot of persecution in one form or fashion. And if you do not know what truth is, and what to stand for, you will fall for anything. And we see that today in our culture. And people, like, um, I, I was listening to a conference and I love this statement. We have a lot of converts out there. They're saved. Like, yay, they believe in Jesus. Woo! Which is good. That's not bad. But we don't have a lot of disciples. Converts believe Jesus is the Savior. But disciples believe he is king and Lord, and they trust him. They will die for him. They will do what is needed no matter who makes fun of them, no matter what is done to them. They believe and trust and will walk out in that faith. And guys, a lot of this, one is is to really help with the anxiety. It's practical. But I also... We need to do some of this to stop the distraction of what's pulling us away from growing deep into the truth of what God says and has for us, okay? There's four rhythms here, and two are input, so what needs to kind of be inputted into us, and the other two are output, what needs to go upwards and outwards, okay? So I'm going to go over these quickly. I'm only going to touch on a few little things here and there. Rest, which P.S. is a verb. I don't know about you, but I was raised in a family. I had divorced parents, both remarried. Out of my four parents, three of them were entrepreneurs and owned their own businesses. Laziness was not an option. And one of my families lived on a farm. And so if you, if any farm kids in here, like the 5 a.m., your butt is up and you're working before you get to get ready and go to school, you have chores and things to do. Um, So whether it be in work, and I'm about ready, I've been a professor and a, so I've had two full-time jobs for the last 10 years. I'm a little exhausted, okay? This is my last year of teaching. This is my last semester of teaching. I think I'm gonna choose to do one full-time job. Um, So it'll be interesting. I'm practicing these things. So it's great. It's rough for those of us who are the high achievers, the doers, and the busyness. But guys, if I can be completely vulnerable and honest with you, I just traded one addiction for another. I just traded drugs, sex, and alcohol for busyness. And I love someone put the acronym busy, being under Satan's yoke. And because I get so distracted, busy, and exhausted, and stressed out, I can't do anything here. I'm just surviving. Anyone else right now? I mean, I I don't know when you guys graduate, but I'm already counting down. I have six weeks left. Anyone else counting down? Anyone else a little stressed, right? Like all the big papers that are like looming and all the big projects that are looming right now. Yeah. And so we get really stressed out and busy Frankly, a lot of us just really suck at time management and prioritizing, let's be honest. But rest, we really do need to rest. This isn't laziness. This is actually doing. But a lot of it is, depending upon our personalities, is how we need to rest. 
Um, there's this one statement, if you work with your mind, you need to rest with your body. If you work with your body, you need to rest with your mind. And so to try to kind of balance some of that out. I have some, um, I teach the Enneagram. I'm actually a coach this, even this weekend. I went and did a training, a two-day training for organizations and churches and things like that. So I don't know if you are familiar with the Enneagram, but um, there's some personalities who need to, their rest is doing like physical exertion of, of working out. And there's some who need to like, hey, you wanna go for coffee? Like we need people time. For some people, people's like draining and some people are life-giving. But also when we pick people, we need to pick better people, okay? Some of us need to, we need, many of us have a broken picker, okay? <laughs> that goes for dating, that goes for friends. Some of us need to learn to have a better picker. <laughs> Um, but, and some of, for some of us, it's like, we need to like withdraw and be alone and just like, um, a little bit. Okay. Um, but rest in resting, we need to take inventory of our life. We need to take a stop. We need to take a breather and we need to become self-aware. We are like the least self-aware generation ever. And I'm not talking like G or G. I don't know, generation, that's where I got the G. Generation Z, I'm talking like those alive right now. You know, this time in our world, we are so distracted. Actually, there's, um, I was gonna kind of talk about this on connection, but just in case I forget, and I'm already almost at time. Um, right now, we are suffering from what's called social ubiquity. And what that means is, through social media, we talk to more humans than ever before, yet we connect with no one. And so we wonder why we feel isolated, why we feel lonely. And I think there's this, probably maybe from your parents, they talk about, oh my gosh, college is amazing. You're gonna meet the, your best friends that you're gonna have for life. And you get here and everyone's like, and you're like, where are the people? They're all in their rooms. And so like, we even talk through gaming, right? We connect through gaming, social gaming. Um, and we, through social media. And again, I'm thankful that we have the technology we do to be able to connect with our families that are coasts or far away. Uh, it's, it's a blessing. But we are talking to people, we are not connecting. There's actually something about seeing some eyeballs in person and having that physiological connection with people that we get filled. Did anyone during shutdown feel the difference? Like I just felt exhausted. I was on Zoom, I was Zooming everything. So I would Zoom teach, and then I would get on for like six to eight hours Zooming my, all my clients doing therapy. And I was exhausted. And all I did was sit my butt in a chair. I was like, how am I so tired? because I'm just pouring out and I'm not connecting. I'm just pouring and pouring and nothing's coming back into me. Okay, so what is right, what is wrong, what is missing, what's confusing? <laughs> is there anything confusing in our, in our time, in our day right now? Just, just a little bit. What do I believe, what do I not believe? They're saying this, they're saying that. I don't know what I'm supposed to, yep. Okay, also, what is, what's right am I doing? What's wrong what I'm doing? What is, what do I need to confess? I can't heal what's not hidden, or I can't heal what is hidden. And shame can only breed in silence. So we really need that other human in person that I can humbly and vulnerably come to and trust to talk about my needs, talk about what's going on, and confess the stuff, okay? Um, tech detox, I feel like you guys hear that all the time. Take a breather from the social media thing. Okay, so I promise, this is the only thing I'm gonna say about the whole social media thing. 
is keep in mind, when we are bored, when we are exhausted, when we are lonely, when we are isolated, when we are frustrated, when we are fearful, especially when we're all of those things, we're bored. So what do we do? We get on our social media. We get on our phones. And we see, especially as women, we love the comparison game, right? It affects us huge. And we're, we're watching everyone else's highlight reel when we're in the ugh. And so we wonder why we start to feel even more like no one cares. We're not like anyone. We, why aren't we doing those things? And we live a life of fear of missing out because everyone else is doing things and I'm not. No, that was just the one thing a month that they did and they posted about it, okay? Um, I promise you, you're not alone. Um, in this day, um, just actually it came out a month ago, the new statistic is one in four adolescents, so again, 12 to 25, 26, um, are experiencing real and um, overwhelming senses of uh, suicidal ideation. And so resting, uh, last restore, okay? So eating well, exercising, knowing who I am, adventure, getting out of your comfort zone, pay attention. Um, I love this. After the fight, flight, freeze, and freak out, ta it takes about 20 minutes for your body to calm down. Um, so do some mindfulness practices, those kind of things. Then connect, move outward, serve, have connections, have people. I'm gonna, I know that COVID tells us don't, so I might get in trouble for this, but do it with your roommates. You're, you're sharing germs anyways. Um, but hugs, holding three to five minutes of a hug, minutes, you're like, seconds. I'm sorry, now it's gonna get awkward, okay? Um, but three to five seconds of a hug holding, um, guys are like, yeah, I'm not doing that. Well, she is kind of hot. Um, so like, hey, <laughs> I hear this release, releases dopamine, wanna hug? <laughs> You're welcome, gentlemen. Um, but <laughs> dopamine does the, the connecting and the befriending, it makes us feel connected. And so it releases, work on the bromance even. Guys, connect, okay? You guys do. Girls were like, okay, it's no big deal. It's like a normal Tuesday. Um, and then create, lean into the boredom. Um, we cannot create without boredom. In the boredom, do the things. Let the mind wander. Let the mind figure out what is helpful, what is um, healthy. Um, take risks. Do something new, okay? I would highly recommend, those of you who really do struggle with anxiety, check out uh, Rebecca Lyon's book. It's not just for women, just because a woman wrote it, um, but it is really great for those who struggle with anxiety. Um, rhythms of renewal, a lot of practical applications. So I know I'm over. Thank you guys so much.